Hey, thanks for clicking on this video and checking out our church service. Whether you're new to Salem or been coming for a while, welcome and hope you enjoy the service. To skip to different parts of the video, there are chapter markers in the description below. So click on one of those to be taken right to that part of the video. Our website has a lot more information about us, so check us out there too. If you're in the Duluth Superior area, you're welcome to join us here at Salem anytime. If you're watching from afar, we hope and pray that we can be an encouragement to you and partner with you for about an hour to help you encounter God, equip people, and extend the gospel. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm so excited to worship with you this morning. I want to encourage you with a quick scripture. I'm reading in 1 Corinthians um, 12, from verse 12. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts from one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether from superior or whether from Duluth, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many parts. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason to stop being part of the body. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God, and this is important, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them. I want to ask you to turn to the person next to you and tell them you belong in the body. You belong in the body. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you are part of the body. We are one in Christ. Amen? Hey, YouTube church fam. Here's what's up at Salem. Thanks for checking out Salem Online. Now, if you want to get connected with us here at Salem, consider filling out the digital connect card linked in the description box and fill it out with as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. And later on, someone from Salem is going to reach out to you to connect with you and answer any questions you may have about our church. On Saturday, November 12th, we are having our operational Christmas child box packing party. And we've been collecting supplies since July. Remember Christmas in July? So we have that box and we've been collecting supplies so that we can have enough supplies to pack just a bunch of boxes together here at Salem. So please make sure that Saturday, November 12th is open on your calendars. In December, wait, December? It's October. Why are you telling us about something in December? Well, I'll tell you, person watching online, because the craft and bake sale in support of Haiti is coming up. And so if you are a crafter, a sewer, a woodworker, or a baker, and you wanna start working on projects that you could donate uh, to this sale in support of Haiti, we would really, really appreciate that. Now, uh, of course, if you're a baker, please, please just think about making stuff. Don't actually make something now for the bake sale uh, in December. That would be really, probably not a good idea. But uh, if you wanna start thinking about what you could make, what you could donate, so that we could support Haiti, uh, we would really appreciate it. Some more information about date and time uh, are coming up soon, uh, but we wanted to put this in front of you so your wheels could start turning on what you could donate. That was a lot of information. And just like in school when you asked, when am I ever going to need algebra, okay? You are going to need the information that I'm giving to you, but I know, just like with algebra, you're not gonna remember everything that I say. So if you need uh, a reminder of the things happening here at Salem, head to salemcovenant.org. The missions page has everything on missions. The events page has contact information, registration links, and things like that. 
And now up next, Chris Dew and the worship team will lead you in worship. And the lyrics are gonna be on the bottom part of this screen for you to follow along with however you feel comfortable from wherever you're watching. And as you engage with us over the next hour or so through the music and the message, we hope and we pray that you encounter God. Well, we're going to worship together. Will you join us as we lift up the name of Jesus in this place? creation to God place the God of redemption open the way the day you gave your life seen the failure in our eyes but the stone and rolled away hey you walked out of that grave let this Why do you look for the living among the grave? Jesus lives, all the earth sing out. The power of death has been broken, this changes everything. The God of perfection became sin the god of salvation changed everything the day you gave your life seemed a failure in our eyes but the stone it rolled away as you walked out of that grave Oh, 
no other God before you There will be no other God before you There is no one above you, no one beside you, nobody like you There will be no other God before you Here we go! No one, no one, no one No one, no one Yahweh Yahweh Holy is your name I don't want to take it in vain Take it in vain There will be no other God before you There will be no other God before you There's no one There is no one above you No one beside you Nobody like you There will be no other God before you no one, no one, no one No one, no one, no one And who else can lead us, lead us to freedom? No one, no one, no one And who else can heal all our sins and diseases? No one no one, no one Who else can walk, walk on the water? And who else can answer, answer by fire? And who else can bring down the tallest of giants? And who else can silence the roar of the lion? is worthy, worthy of worship. And who else is worthy, worthy of worship? There will be no other God before you. There will be no other God before you. There is no one above you, no one beside you. Nobody like you There is no one above you No one beside you Nobody like you There is no one above you No one beside you Nobody like you There will be no other God before you No one, no one, no one, no one Thank you, Jesus. There's none like you. There's no one who loves like you do. Thank you for your love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the
Jesus for your wonderful, undeserving, amazing love for every one of us. No matter what we've done, no matter what's been done to us, Thank you that your word says that nothing can separate us from your love. Not demons, not angels, not death, not life. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Thank you for your marvelous love. We worship you. Amen. Thank you. You may take your seats. I'm Jesse, I'm the uh, Hospitality and Outreach Director, and I just, I was blown away, and I'm going off script, so I apologize, Stephen. Um, I was blown away this morning. Like, it is, I, I was thinking of Psalm 23, is like, he leads me by, or he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me by quiet waters, he restores my soul, and like, worshiping with you guys this morning was just like, wow, like, this is a little taste of heaven, and I just, I love it so much. Um... So I'll, I'll get back on script. So I just wanted to let you guys know that I really, really enjoyed worship this morning with you guys. Um, there's pastor appreciation box up front here. Uh, so if you have a card, a word of encouragement, uh, that, that's what that's for. Um, and we want to appreciate Stephen and all the hard work he does putting up with me. Um, <clears throat> and other staff, and other staff too. Um, but uh, no, it's great. And then also in, in, in thought process of reaching out to our staff and stuff like that, we have connect cards. So if you're a uh, first time visitor, if you are, um, you know, maybe a, a couple times guest, a uh, three years, four years, uh, been here your entire life and want to get a hold of us, uh, you can always put in a connect card, fill it out, put it in the offering plate or put it in uh, the offering box, bring it to the Welcome Center. We'd love to reach out to you and get connected with you. Also, if you're online, we have this really cool feature on our website. Uh, it's called the Visitor tab. You can click that and you can get the connect card through that online as well. So we, we thought about you guys. All right. Um, and one of the things that is great about it is it helps us establish connections with you guys outside of Sunday morning, uh, which is not always the best time for staff to engage with you guys. And, and we really care and want to get to know you, but we're just super busy on Sundays a lot of times. So please reach out to us. We'd love to meet with you. Um, and I love coffees, just anyone else out there. Um, but another great way, uh, we've been really working on trying to establish connections with our local ministries. And uh, yesterday we had our mission day, uh, and one of the things that we were able to do is we were able to go out there. Uh, my dad came from California to do this. Not He was visiting me, but... Um, so we were able to go out, and we were just able to bless a family by... We were doing just basic yard work, um, and they're, they're in the process of adopting uh, four children from the foster care system, and they've just been overrun by... Uh, these new responsibilities, and it was, uh, they just were so appreciative of us going out there and serving. So um, I do plan to work with Stephen to schedule more days like this, more t opportunities for us to serve as a, as a community, and I highly encourage you guys to, you know, sign up for them. We'll try letting you go, know well in advance so you can clear your schedules, um, but participate. It's, it's an awesome, awesome ministry to have. Um, and now, yeah, my dad loading up rocks. Uh, we were making a French ditch, which I didn't know was a thing until yesterday, so I learned something new. Um, so with, uh, with ministries that we have here, I'm gonna, I want to talk about Stephen's ministry just real quick. Um, it is an awesome, awesome opportunity that we have to have Stephen minister serving in our congregation, helping with grief and loss, and, and just in general prayer. Um, it, there, there are prayer warriors that we have that we can use, and uh, they will be available at the uh, closing song. Uh, so when we're at the end of the service and there's a closing song, please utilize them. Even if you don't feel that you need someone praying for you, I've gone up sometimes not really feeling that I, I need prayer and then finding out, wow, I really needed prayer. Um, so just take advantage of that.
Good morning. Uh, speaking of I am's, I am Clay Armstrong. Uh, and I am also the person who's going to be reading uh, John 1, verses 1 through 18 for you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. With him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that was life, the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the lights, so that, uh, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the lights. He only came as a witness to the lights. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world uh, was made through him, and though the world was made through him. Uh, the, word, the world did not recognize him, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become his children. Uh, oh, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of one and only son of the one and only of his son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his faithfulness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Good morning, church, and uh, welcome to everyone online as well. I'm Pastor Stephen Osborne, and it is so exciting to um, start this new book study as we look at the book of John. And um, we're just going to take our time over the next several months as we work through it and as we um, look at the context, obviously, of this book and also how it applies to our lives and how the Holy Spirit wants to speak um, to us. Let me pray for us. Father God, we are so grateful this morning that we can gather in this building, that we can be your church, that we have this opportunity to, to set aside all of the, the things from the week and to focus and put all of our attention on, on you. And so help us to do that well this morning. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you will encourage, that you will inspire, that you will convict, that you will transform through the power of your word. Help us to believe this morning again. Build up great faith in this church, in our lives. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Father, I pray that we will leave with a new understanding this morning of this tremendous grace that you have bestowed on us. Help us to drink deeply from your Holy Spirit. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is um, such a, a blessing in all of the information that we have around us. We think about technology, right? Um, I mean, we have just a... a, a an endless amount of information that we can gather throughout the day, through TV, through our cell phones. Um, and so many times, unfortunately, not you because you're sitting here at church this morning or watching online, but a lot of times we can develop all kinds of theology and ideas around God which is not biblical. 
And that really impacts the way that we live out our faith. And so um, I had to smile kind of last night just thinking about some of these things. You know, uh, and, uh, there was an old, when I was a kid, um, I watched The Simpsons. I don't know why my parents allowed me to watch The Simpsons, right? And there's just great theology in The Simpsons. <laughs> I mean, a lot of that I'm going to share with you this morning. Now, you should be running then. Um, but uh, some, I mean, and it's amazing how much faith conversations and church conversations and kind of this, these views about God we see in The Simpsons. And if you don't have scripture, if you don't know scripture, if you're not part of a faith community, uh, I am sure you can be naive and maybe open up this door and for some of these lies to really affect the way that you think about God. And so we have to be careful uh, from where we take in all of our information, especially when it comes to information about God. And so over the next several months, we can't go wrong when we study God's Word, and especially as we zone in and take time to study the book of John. Now, we can read things, and you know, we have wonderful biblical authors. We're just, we finish up with um, Max Lucado, and I think he is so gifted, and he loves the Lord, right? And, and he has a way of sharing information and truths about God. But still, it doesn't compare from what we can get from God's Word and from John himself, that we can be on a place where we can sit here this morning and we can study John. And what makes it so special is John walked with Jesus. He experienced God, Jesus, the presence of Jesus. He, he experienced these stories. He experienced intimacy. Now, that's the type of person where I want to grab my information from and not the Simpsons <laughs> or whatever other sources we might have. And so no wonder even John is very clear with us in, in this book um, where he mentions and he writes, he says, I'm giving, I'm writing to you so that you might believe. So that we might believe. That's, that's the heart of this gospel. As John writes and as he instills in us through the gift of the Holy Spirit, is that our faith may grow. That we may believe these truths about Jesus. That when we pray and when we read and our understanding of who he is, that there's a reality that will hit our hearts in the right way. And so it is my prayer with John as we work through this book that we might believe. Will you believe with me this morning? Okay, well, it was a fun service with you this morning. <laughs> uh, hopefully there's a little bit more coffee out there. Will you believe with me this morning? This doesn't help. You could have stayed in bed this morning if we don't believe, if we don't build, build up faith. Now, let me just, for two minutes, as we look at the book of John, I'm just going to share with you quickly um, the Bible nerd in me, okay? And then I'll get it out of my system, and then we'll, we'll preach. This morning... As we look at verse 1 to verse 18, I want you to understand and know this. This is actually Greek poetry. So 1 to 18 is actually a prologue, kind of this introduction. And what John is doing, he is in these 18 verses exposing us to information uh, of the rest of the book. 
And he does it so skillfully and so uh, poetically to share with us like, man, let me give you bits and pieces of the salvation plan. Let me give you some bits and pieces of God's grace, of his love. And hopefully through these introduction verses, I'm going to make you so hungry that you will just look at the rest of the book. And that's what we see. And actually, um, verse 1 to 18, when you kind of understand Greek poetry, you, in a sense, have to read it like a dance. Now, I don't know if anybody enjoys dancing. Some of you might say, well, I'm in church. I can't confess to dancing that I like dancing right now, right? Um, in South Africa, uh, dancing is big. We actually call it soki. Okay, um, I've seen Christo, he's got some good moves, right? <laughs> and um, so it's like you can't wait for weddings because you want a socky, right? And American weddings are just not the same. Nobody wants to socky, you know? You guys all have some weird individual circle, the chicken dance moves. It's like, <laughs> that, that's not dancing, all right? What was the movie with the hitch? Was it the guy who was like, we had to learn to dance? It's like, you know, keep it here. It's like, and so I just feel awkward American weddings. It's like, just keep it here, Stephen. There's just a hundred people looking at you right now. Just keep it here. It's like, I can't dance like that. So we want a sake. So in dancing, when you're actually dancing, some key moves is the turn, right? You got to turn. And so when you look at verse 1 to 18, you kind of have to see it as this beautiful dance that is happening. And then verse 1 and verse 2, that's a turn. And then verse 3 and 5, it's another turn. And so just it, it beautiful what John is doing here. And when, again, when you look at the Greek and you understand it, what he's trying to, how he's trying to set us up to understand the full story and what is coming. In 1 Kings chapter 8, um, King Solomon is praying over the new temple. Everyone is so excited about this new temple, and you can only imagine why, right? It's going to be the dwelling place of God himself. And as he's commissioning and as he's praying over the, the temple, he makes this incredible statement or asks this question, but will God really live on earth? Why? Even the highest heavens cannot contain you how much less this temple I have built. And really, it doesn't make sense when we, we think about that moment of God dwelling, staying in a temple. And so no wonder Solomon, with this knowledge and revelation of who God is, this creator of heavens and earth, how can we capture his presence into this building. It doesn't make sense. All of his, his glory. And the same way when we look at this passage, this chapter, and to ask how is it that we have Jesus? How is it that we have the creator of heavens and earth and all of his splendor and glory how is it that he comes into flesh and walk this earth? What's the motivation? How can anybody give up the heavenlies to be stuck in flesh, walk a very sinful and painful world? At least in my mind, I don't get it. I don't understand it. And it might be that I just don't really have a good understanding and revelation of God's love. 
And maybe we just, we don't. I get glimpses of it, but really I need a lot of work to have the full revelation of how much God loves us. Because I know my love is so limited, right? If you hurt me, I'm going to remove my love, right? If you angered me, you don't deserve my love. And yet, this is not the way that God functions. And yet, when we look at verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Everything starts and ends with God. We have such beautiful truth here about the Trinity of God. The Trinity of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Son, Jesus Christ. And we're just reminded that Jesus isn't this afterthought, right? That he is God. And he was there in the beginning. I love this definition, just kind of as we, we ponder this verse from the Blue Letter Bible. Because even again, you know, we can talk Trinity I don't know if you've had the opportunity to try and, and share with a four-year-old or, or with a six-year-old to explain the Trinity. I don't know how many times I have done it, right? I have come up with all kinds of cool illustrations, and then I just kind of hope the kid gets it. <laughs> it's like, and that's all I got for you right now. I've got a phone call. Don't ask me other questions. And I think for us, true, as believers, we get it. In a sense, we understand it, but still there is something so beautiful about it that we might not understand it completely until we're one day in the presence of God. But at least there's some commentary from the Blue Letter Bible. It's the Father and the Son, the Son is known here as the Word, are equally God yet distinct in their person. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, yet they are equally God, with God the Holy Spirit making one God in three persons. Isn't that beautiful? And that's what's being revealed here to us, that it's God through flesh showing up, walking this earth, and you'll see kind of the reason why as we look through the rest of this chapter. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There's so many beautiful references when, about the light in this book. It's really a, a main topic, a main focus, when we ask ourselves, so why in the world will our Creator send His beloved Son to this broken world? And in a sense, in this beautiful, beautiful verse, we discover the purpose of it all. And it's to remind us that in this world there is darkness. There's pain. I mean, we see it actually throughout Scripture. Different stories that happens in the darkness and in all reality, and I don't know why, but as people, we have a drawing <laughs> to the dark. We're constantly facing the dark. Things happening in our hearts that represents darkness and the work of Satan 
himself. That is just reality. Just look around us and we are aware of this brokenness, of the darkness that is happening around us. Even when we reflect on the story of Judas betraying Jesus in a moment of darkness. That is the stark reality of our world, that yes, there is darkness, and part of that reason is because th there's no presence of light. And somehow, in God's great mercy, He sends His Son to be the light, to show us that this can be overcome, that we can experience light in this world, that we can experience light in our life, because so many times the enemy and Satan and demonic forces can tell us that we are trapped, that there's no hope for this darkness. And that is such a lie out of hell. Jesus came to show us light. And when he, when he talks about light here, it's more than just light in a sense what we're thinking. It represents his presence. It represents his glory. Wow. How is it that as a church we can be on a place where you and I in our broken world and our moments of darkness that we can experience the grace of God where we can experience his glory, his presence. Just like in the beginning, because when you read these words in John, it says, in the beginning was the word. It obviously um, grabbed the attentions of those early Jewish believers because they were immediately reminded of Genesis chapter 1, which says, man, in the beginning, God created. And when he looked at earth and it was formless and it was dark, and then he spoke and he says, let there be light. And suddenly you have this image of man, this purpose, this light. Nothing is dark anymore. And the same way to say that as the, those same words that we read about in Genesis 1, in Genesis 1, that same power, that same authority that formed the world. It is those same words that comes to us in the flesh. To speak life and light into our lives. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that powerful? Just in these five verses, all of this rich truths. And John is reminding us, man, I write these things so that you may believe. I hope this morning that you will believe that you and I can experience light. You and I don't have to be stuck in darkness. And in verse 6, it reminds us there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning to the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world he was the world, he was in the world, and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. Verse 11, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. As I was reading that, that kind of just hit me. Uh, in such an emotional tone, right? Doesn't make much in any case lately to make me cry. <laughs> um, I don't know if you have ever, maybe as a kid, different things either in sports where, you know, where you, when you're in a, in a situation where you get to play a game and there's two teams and somebody's got to pick, right? And you kind of know you're not the best player in that moment and you're probably going to be the last one and there's kind of a little bit of that tension that shame it's like man i want to be the first one i want to be seen as the one that's the fastest pick me pick me 
And yet in that moment, sometimes we just experience rejection. And in life, we so many times can experience rejection for all kinds of different reasons. And I read, as I read this, I read a sense of deep rejection of Jesus coming to this earth, giving up everything in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly realms to walk this earth, to suffer for us, to, to die for his kids, and yet they don't recognize him. How many times did Jesus not show up in the temple courts and people rejected him? They had no clue, they had no idea that this is the Savior. This is the one that they have prophesied about for centuries, going back to the book of Isaiah, that there's a light that is coming, and yet nobody recognized this is the light. This is our Savior. It is so beautiful for me when I just think about these moments, how Jesus reveals his love and his light and his hope in these incredible stories. Just look at Acts chapter 16. If you want to turn with me to Acts 16, um, we'll read, we'll start in verse, uh, let's do verse 22. Acts 16, verse 22. Oh man, my time is up. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, if you have your highlighter here, just highlight that at midnight. In a dark moment, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners has, had ex escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And he then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Isn't it so beautiful that in the midst of midnight and dark moments where Paul and Silas, you know, Probably could have soaked, licked their wounds of a, a good weapon, feeling discouraged, and yet they're here in this incredible moment at midnight, in a season where things look so dark and impossible, and where we're just reminded of John's like, man, just believe, believe. And they do. And it's their belief and in their faith in this beautiful light that they can worship and call on the God of light in that horrible situation and where the light can break through and deliver. And not just deliver, but ministers to a whole family. That's the light. That's what John is trying to remind us of the one we serve and the one that we worship. Look one more. I'll try and rush. Mark 9, 14. Another story. Mark 9, 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw large crowds, sorry, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law are arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever he, 
It seizes him, it throws him into the ground. He, f he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becoming rigid. I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has this been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And then the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. And the boy is free. That's what we're, we're reminded of, this incredible light. Don't for one minute, don't think that this type of stuff is not happening in our world. We still have people that's possessed. We still have people that is trapped in darkness. And yet we still have the answer. We know the light. We know Jesus. And he can still break through. Ephesians 5.8 says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Just as John was showing the way and he was proclaiming about the light that, is, that was coming, in the same way I believe we carry that same testimony, that same responsibility because we know that Jesus is coming again. Amen? And our world is experiencing darkness. And how do they see the light? How do they experience this hope? Through us. Through the light that is shining in us. I was pondering kind of just this whole rejecting peace, you know, and just thinking about my own life. And I wondered, like, Lord, where in my own life do I sometimes reject you? A couple of things that comes to mind. So many times in this world we might hear people say, well, I'm not a bad person. Guess what? We're all bad. We all fall short. In all of your good deeds, you will still fall short. There is no such thing as a good person without Jesus Christ. There's only one thing that makes us good and it makes us righteous. And that is the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. And so every time that I think it is my good works, I take away from the cross. Every time that you have a conversation with somebody and they come up with this line, well, I'm a good person. You and I have an opportunity to say through your words, you are rejecting God that you and I are doing the same thing that was talked about in John. Another way that I believe that we so many times reject God is our love for sin. We do it, right? Sin is all around us and it's something that we all wrestle with. And it is my prayer as a church, as individuals, as your pastor, we fall short and we do need the grace of God. 
but for us to be on a place where we hate sin. And maybe that should just be our prayer for this year. Say, Lord, help us to hate sin. Another way that our world rejects God is by saying the Bible is not God's word. One more. Maybe it's hard hearts. You know, sometimes through pain, through rejection, a hundred other reasons, it's easy for us to protect our hearts or we've lost our faith and we get hard hearts and we're not sensitive for the Holy Spirit anymore. And it's in those moments when we deny the work of the Holy Spirit, when we deny the cross, that just like John, we reject God himself. Going back to that passage or that thought about Solomon, say, how can this God live among us? It is amazing when you look at uh, our passage in John. We're reminded that Jesus came to tabernacle to live among us. Back in the Old Testament, we saw this image of the tabernacle and all of the, the 12 tribes. Um, there was a lot of details in the way that they had to camp. But the tabernacle that represented the presence of God was right in the middle of all of these tribes. And it represented that Jesus wants to tabernacle, to dwell among them. And John, through this incredible passage, just reminds us again this morning that still this is true. I don't always get it. That why God wants to dwell? Why does God wants to tabernacle? Why does God wants to, why does he want to be right in the center of my life? It doesn't make sense. But it's his love. It is his grace. He wants to be in fellowship with us. Church, this morning, I just want you to have this revelation, this sweet, beautiful revelation that God desires to tabernacle with you, <laughs> to be the center piece of your heart, that we as a church can just adore him where we allow the light his manifest presence his glory to shine through us and in our midst john continues and he just kind of reveals this reason why and i just again with with spurgeon i love this quote he says if god has come to dwell among men by the word made flesh let us pitch our tents around the central tabernacle do not let us live as if god were a long way off a lot of times because of our own shortcomings and because of sin or guilt or brokenness it's hard for us to believe that god wants to dwell with us that his presence and his grace is for us this morning. And through John, I love this. Just look at John just, and I'll wrap up. And this is what it's all about for me this morning. Look at verse 16. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. What he means with this statement is to say, you and I might not experience the end of his grace. His grace continues. 
And there's this perfect balance. Again, when you just look at some of those verses, it reminds us that Jesus is perfect. When you think about this balance of truth and grace. So many times the church is perfect in truth. We're easy to tell people the truth. But we don't always have a good balance with truth and grace. And may that be true for us as we share this, may we believe this morning that His grace is for us. Two scriptures and then we'll pray. And the God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. Second Chronicles, for the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Let us pray. Father God, we're so grateful for your grace. We're so grateful for light. We're so grateful for your presence. I want to encourage you this morning, if you have some areas in your life where there's still darkness, if there's still some areas in your life that's under bondage, where you feel like Satan is constantly poking, will you just invite God's presence into those areas. Say, Jesus, I repent. It is not your desire for me to have this darkness. You are the God of light. You are the one that wants to deliver. You are the one that wants to set free. And then this morning, I just want to remind you That you and I can experience grace upon grace. Even when you think about all of your brokenness this morning and things that you're maybe dealing with. Don't disqualify yourself. This morning as we worship, run through these doors of grace. May we experience the presence of God in this place this morning. May you experience the presence of God in your, la- in your life. He longs to dwell with you. Psalm reminds us that we get the opportunity to delight in God. When there is darkness, there's guilt and when there's guilt it will steal the opportunities and moments to delight in God and so Holy Spirit I pray now in these moments will you bring light will you bring healing father will you take this moment and help us to delight as your children because that's who we are your word in John reminds us that we are your children don't let Satan steal that truth don't let the world steal that truth thank you for making us righteous thank you for adopting us this morning as your children may it give us great joy may it give us great peace and may your light shine through our broken lives for your glory in jesus name will you stand with me
for your cross, Jesus. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of
video, please let us know what you think by leaving a comment on this video or email Salem at SalemCovenant.org. Don't forget to stay up to date with all of Salem's activities at SalemCovenant.org slash events. And since you made it to the end of this video, consider filling out our Connect card. It's just a way for you to start a conversation with us via email or a phone call. There's a link to that in the description box below. All right, see you next week.